There's something going on in rural America today, which is, I think, oftentimes not fully appreciated or recognized in Washington, D.C., or perhaps in state capitals around the country. And that is that the economy of rural America is changing. Uh, and for the first time in a long time, we have a framework in place that will allow us to turn to our sons and daughters and our grandchildren and say to them that we have opportunities in rural America for you to raise your families and to experience the American dream. And it starts with production agriculture. As you all know, production agriculture is experiencing good times. Last year we had record income. One of the reasons we had record income is because America is now in a position because of the work of seed companies and our extraordinarily talented farmers and ranchers and producers to be able to produce enough for our country to be self-sufficient for its own food needs and then be able to export. Last year we did $137 billion of agricultural exports. It's shattered the previous record by over $22 billion. It left us with a trade surplus of $42 billion. And this year we expect another strong year in exports. You can't have that story. You can't have the jobs supported by agricultural exports, nearly a million, without seed. It starts with the capacity of seed companies to continue to allow American producers to be extraordinarily productive. In my lifetime, corn production has increased over 300%. Soybeans and wheat, nearly 200%. So that capacity to produce what we need and then to export and to create jobs is a critical component to a changing rural economy. It also provides Americans with something that very few people anywhere else in the world have, which is the capacity to say we have the power and the opportunity and the capacity in the United States to produce what we need to feed ourselves. We virtually have to import nothing to feed our people. We have food security, which is a national security advantage. And it starts with you. One challenge is our continued need for investment in research. The agricultural research budget of this nation has been, at the government level, flatlined for far too long. The private companies represented in this room today have invested, continue to invest, and will always invest in research because you understand the importance and power of that notion. But we've got to do a better job of convincing our policymakers in Congress of the need to consider agricultural research in the same vein as we do healthcare research. As someone explained to me the other day when I was talking about why it was that the NIH was more successful, I said they basically sell the notion they can cure cancer. My staff member looked at me and said, cure cancer, we can prevent cancer with proper nutrition and proper product development. We need to continue to make the case that agricultural research is as important to this nation. Because the, re the research and the data is fairly clear, when you stop investing in research, you stop being productive. And we have an enormous productivity challenge. The world population continues to grow. The estimates, as you all know, that we have to increase food productivity by 70% in the next 40 years to be able to feed 7, 8, 9 billion people. How are we going to do that? You have to help us figure this out. How are we going to do it not just as the population increases, but as we are confronted with a changing climate? Now, we can debate what is causing that change, but there's no doubt that the climate is changing and the seed companies of this country have got to figure out how we adapt and mitigate the consequences of that. That's an enormous challenge, and on top of that, you have to figure out how to do that when we will likely have less water. How do you continue to be productive in agriculture with less water? That's an enormous challenge. If we think we have difficulties from a security standpoint today, as we deal with oil issues, imagine a world where we're fighting over food and water. It will require the rest of the world to accept and embrace science, which is also part of our challenge. As we deal with our international friends about the science that's being created in this country that's allowed us to be extraordinarily productive, 
we find folks who don't necessarily buy into that notion. And we have been working at USDA with a strategy to try to get a greater acceptance of the science. We've been working in face-to-face -face meetings with my counterparts in other countries to explain that we will not get to 70% productivity without embracing science and acknowledging what it can do for us. And part of it not only is an embracing of science, but it's also a recognition that our regulatory processes have got to be in sync with the science. We began a process here at USDA to accelerate our review, not sacrificing the quality of the review, but understanding that it's necessary as seed companies want to experiment and want to look at possible modifications, they need the permission and capacity to do so. But it does little good for the United States to move forward in an accelerated way if we can't have some of our other international partners be able to move with us. There's also the issue of low-level presence. As we deal with our counterparts in Europe and other parts of the world, these issues must be addressed and they must be finished and concluded. We've got to have an international understanding. As our testing equipment becomes more sophisticated, our capacity to detect parts per billion becomes easier. And it's going to be necessary if we're to embrace science, if we're to approach the challenge of feeding an ever-increasing world population with scarce resources, we've got to have an international understanding of exactly how much is too much.